Hi, and welcome to the first lecture or introductory lecture uh, for OPR 703 course. And this is the Introduction to General and Systemic Pathology. I am Parish Sadizade. I'm the program director for Oral Pathology and Radiology Distance Learning Program here at the University of Southern California through the Herman Ostro School of Dentistry. And I just wanted to first welcome you and uh, just give you a little bit of insight as to why I started this program and what kind of team we have. And so uh, this program is really designed for the practicing professional and uh, in oral health care, uh, dentists, uh, dental hygienists, auxiliaries, anyone that's actually one interested in this topic or wants to gain more knowledge uh, in this area. And oral diagnosis, the pillars of oral diagnosis are really pathology and radiology. And with the advent of CBCT and telepathology, a lot of these um, areas are expanding. So it really lends itself well to doing a distance learning program in this. The goal of this one-year certificate program is to, for you to gain knowledge and understanding in these disciplines of oral and maxillofacial pathology and oral and maxillofacial radiology, or basically oral diagnosis. The way it's designed, I actually designed this course. Um, we have several expert faculty here at the university that will be teaching you. You'll see us like this being recorded. Um, and, and, and giving you lectures, and then we'll have conference calls. So hopefully by the time you have this first lecture, we'll have done a conference call initially with everyone, and you'll know who we are. But we're a group of board-certified experts uh, in oral and maxillofacial pathology, oral and maxillofacial radiology, oral facial pain, oral medicine, um, and and the list goes on and on. So you're you're. And a lot of the content that we're creating is novel uh, uh, and innovative because this there is no program like this. This hasn't been done before, um, and it's the it's unique and the first of its kind. So I'm excited to be working with you, and um, and I look forward to it. So I'll go ahead and get started with this lecture, and it'll give you some background into what to expect for this specific course, and also some of the other courses uh, when you start seeing. Uh, myself and some of the other faculty in the other lectures, you'll kind of have an idea of, of the method to this madness and how it's designed and the way this curriculum is going to go. Um, so for those of you that haven't been here, haven't been in any of our programs, we are at the University of Southern California. We're home of the Trojans, a school with a very rich athletic and sports background. Uh, the most Olympic medal winning uh, university in this country, um, 309 medals, um, more than <laughs> some countries, uh, many countries over the years. This is the dental school, and you can see here it says the Herman Oster School of Dentistry uh, on the main campus or University Park campus. And this is the view at night showing the campus and downtown LA in the background where we are located right in the heart of Los Angeles and this down here where you can see my mouse cursor going this is General Hospital the old um, the building that was seen in the old um, uh, soap opera and television show General Hospital uh, we call it County Hospital also this is mainly office uh, space and storage space now and uh, there's several new hospitals and research facilities built on this campus, which is called the Health Science Campus. Uh, and the dental school has some space here called the Center, Center for Craniofacial Molecular Biology, which is a very um, uh, notable, long-standing, and well-funded uh, research facility for craniofacial biology and molecular biology. And then you can see this building here in downtown, a view at night, one of these high rises is now the USC building. It used to be the AT&T building. Uh, but you will also be introduced to this area as we have some of our programs uh, for the distance learning in, in this space also. So, um, you know, it's an exciting place to be, an exciting university. Um, just the interesting tidbits, USC is the largest private employer in the state of California. Um, generates over $8 billion revenue a year. Uh, more than 1% of the state's economy. So it's a behemoth and it's an exciting place to be and it's exciting for you to be a part of this 
Um, so with that, I welcome you and let's get into why we're doing general pathology uh, to begin with and why this is one of the first courses you're going to have. In this summer semester, you're going to learn a lot of didactic information, so mainly courses with a little bit of um, conference calls and online uh, discussions. Uh, but we'll have more of that later. The goal in the first couple of semesters especially is to give you the, the didactic and foundational knowledge in these topic areas. And, and general pathology is very important and general medicine is very important before you can really even appreciate oral pathology and oral medicine and oral radiology, for example. Um, so on this first slide here, uh, as I get into this, I'll explain to you why you know we're going to teach you general pathology first, and and before I even do that, I'm going to I have a little remote control you can probably see here. I have a camera in front of me. I want to show you how we do some of this. So the camera, I'm going to move the camera now, and the camera is going all the way to the side, and at some point it's going to hit a bright you know light that's shining on me. So I'm getting some nice uh, um, UV rays here, getting a good tan while I'm doing this. And then all the way over here, you'll see there's a door and then part of a screen. So there's a big screen in front of me. And then as we go back here, this is me. So we're back to me. And we're in a conference room. And so there's a big screen in front of me. And then there's a camera in front of that. And then I'm here sitting at a table. And the lights are shining on me. And the reason I tell you this is because we'll be recording these things as faculty in different places. Uh, some of us from our offices in our homes, some of us from conference rooms. This is at the university um, where we have this nice little setup. Some will be from laptops. Don't worry so much about how it's recorded and the lighting and things like that. Um, some of these will be updated and changed over time. What I want you to focus though on is the content. Um, you know, we're really providing you unique and, and, and excellent content in, in my opinion. And so, um, Hopefully you'll enjoy it and, and you'll get a, and you, you get a little greater insight into how, how this is working and what we're, uh, what we're trying to do. Um, so sometimes it may look like we're looking up or we're looking down. And the reason for that is we're usually looking at the screen in order to teach you what we need to teach you from the PowerPoint, which you'll also be seeing at the same time. Um, and so it, you can't put a camera right in the middle of the screen and block the entire screen, then we wouldn't be able to see it. So. That's just why sometimes our eyes look like they're wandering here and there. So anyway, back to this slide. Why general pathology and medicine? Why do we have to learn this? Why do we have to know it? Um, we don't have to know everything about it. Pathology is years and years of education, lots of textbooks. Um, any one of these subspecialties, even in dentistry, like oral pathology, is just is generally just a few years. So how much can we learn in one year? I think we can learn enough the basics um, to really understand how to apply this to our practice and to be at a much better place than we were before uh, some of this insight and knowledge. So oral and maxillofacial structures are part of several body systems. If you think about the structures that are here, the jaw bone is part of the skeletal system, uh, the mouth, the mucosa, part of the gastrointestinal system. There's the neuromuscular system that's represented here, vascular system, the respiratory system. This is the upper respiratory system. So these maxillofacial or head and neck structures are actually key and integrated to many different systems. And this is why knowledge of basic body systems like physiology or the pathology of these systems, pathophysiology, is very, very important. So knowledge of these systems overall and their anatomy and normal tissues is necessary to understand abnormalities that arise from these tissues and systems. So topics like histology, autopsy, forensics, molecular pathology, immunopathology, um, and several other aspects of pathology like clinical pathology, surge path, are key to understanding how cells, cellular biology, biochemistry, physics, and anatomy dictate disease processes. And the, the, there's a lot of insight in, in just these couple of sentences that I put on this slide. And you'll hopefully over time appreciate what, I'm, what I mean by this. We are going to show you histology. We're going to teach you histology. We're going to show you autopsy cases. And, and the point isn't so you memorize lots of slides and memorize lots of conditions and learn the A to Z of every disease that's out there. That's impossible to do. And, and most of us are still learning that. And, and no one in their lifetime will learn every disease and be an expert on everything. But 
Um, the reason these are important and we're going to teach you is because they give insight into what's happening with cells and tissues, how they're behaving, and why that leads to what we see clinically, and then guides how we treat the patient clinically to get an outcome that we want or a desired outcome. So pathology requires knowledge of normal anatomy and physiology first. And that means you need to understand macroscopic anatomy, which we call gross anatomy, and also microscopic anatomy, what we call histology. And so if you break down anatomy in this way, which I like to do generally when I teach in order for students to understand it, is that there's macroscopic anatomy and there's microscopic anatomy. So what you can see, color, touch, feel, texture, all that stuff in the clinic, and then microscopic anatomy which you can't see as far as cells go. And that's why you need the histology. And that's why it's one of the gold standards for diagnosis of lesions, because it allows you to see in higher magnification cellular morphology and tissues and see what they're actually doing and, and then make diagnoses based on that. What's beautiful about radiology, which is what this uh, program is, oral pathology and radiology, is that, that radiology is just another level of anatomy, right? We could after microscopic here and microscopic, we could add radiographic. Um, and radiographic is in ways, you know, a macroscopic slash microscopic view of heart tissue structures. When we look at x-rays, for example, um, or CBCT scans, it gives us a lot of information and insight into heart tissue structures, which is anatomic information. So it tells you what's happening anatomically. And that's just the very first step to be able to appreciate what's going on with pathology. So we, there's this little saying in pathology that most pathology at a site usually arises from structures that are already there. And the course of disease involves alterations in this normal physiology. And, and we'll look at examples of that and reinforce some of these concepts that I'm introducing here. All right, moving along. So one of the things I want to introduce to you is that Textbooks and monograms are very, and monographs are very important for foundational knowledge um, in a discipline. For example, in general pathology, there's textbooks like Robbins or Rubin's um, pathology, and, and these have really been pillars uh, of, of the profession for teaching kind of early foundational knowledge. And the reason textbooks are a great resource, and, and now you can get these digitally or online, but uh, some people still like to have hard, hard copies. But the reason either way that they're good resources is because they are written by experts in the field. And this is what the experts think that you should know, at the very least, for things like content knowledge or board exams. Um, they're also great references for primary cited literature. So when you look at every chapter, at the end of the chapter, there'll be a bunch of citations. Those are great for going a little further in depth or go understanding some of the historical or primary context for what those experts wrote in those chapters. And that really helps with understanding key issues in the field. Uh, textbooks and monographs also aid in understanding threshold concepts. And, and I'll talk a little bit more about what a threshold concept is and why uh, that, that's important. And, but you'll note that the syllabus for this course and for the other you know, courses or classes, if you will, um, lectures in, in this program really are designed to mirror and incorporate much of textbook material. Obviously not covered all in a year, but these are why these are the recommended readings, for example, and, and, and how um, I've tried to design many of these um, courses and lectures. And you'll see why. Um, so threshold knowledge or threshold concept is something that I want to introduce you now. In education, in, in adult learning and learning theory, threshold knowledge is important because we can't cover everything in a short amount of time or in like one lecture um, or even in one year on these types of topics. It, it takes several years or even a lifetime. Um, so. Threshold knowledge is a term in the study of higher education used to describe core concepts that, once they're understood, transform perception of a given subject. So they're very important, discrete, high-yield type of information that applies broadly to a lot of stuff and helps you understand a lot of different things. 
Um, and, and this is, here's a citation if you're interested in reading more about this. Um, like any uh, educational theory, there are controversies and, and there's limitations to it and things like that. But I think it's an important concept and one that I try to incorporate in, in, in my teaching material uh, and in, in, in what I want you to learn so that it, you learning one concept takes less amount of time um, but will apply to lots of different things versus trying to learn every single one of those concepts. So here is a couple of pathology textbooks, Rubens and Robbins, that I was mentioning earlier. And note how the chapters are organized. Look at, for example, here, general pathology textbook. Um, and this is basically um, the index or outline that's the table of contents, if you will, that tells you what's in the textbook, what you're going to learn, and what the title of all these chapters are. And note that the first chapter is the cell as a unit of health and disease. You know, although this is only about 30 pages with references, it tells you the importance of cell biology. And cell biology isn't 30 pages of material, it's a whole textbook of material. But it is important and the foundation for learning beyond um, the cell as a unit uh, you know, of health and disease. You have to kind of understand the cell before you can go on and understand the whole organ or tissues and, and, and how those cells come together and what they do and how they talk to each other and, and, and chemicals and signals and all that kind of stuff. So cell biology is very, very important. If you look at this table of contents for another pathology, general pathology textbook here, you see chapter one, cell adaptation, cell injury, cell death. Again, very important that you understand the cell here in this one. Chapter two, cellular responses, adaptation, injury, and death. So you can see there's a lot of mirroring in two different textbooks. And this is very important because this basically tells you that, that the cell is very important and you need to understand the cell to understand pathology. And histopathology, looking at slides, looking at under a microscope, looking at, at digitized you know, um, uh, biopsy specimens, is basically observing cells in frozen action, if you will, uh, frozen in time. Uh, when it was taken out and fixed in formalin and then brought, you know, to the pathologist under the slide to make a diagnosis. And, you, and so we're going we're gonna to do that and we're going to look at that. If you look at the syllabus for this course and then you look at um, our courses in oral pathology and um, oral medicine, a lot of them are going to follow this kind of flow of learning first about cell injury, cell death, inflammation, cell repair, et cetera, et cetera. So um, if you look at these chapters, you'll see that you really don't have to understand inflammation, genetics, immunology, and neoplasia before you can even get into the different systems. And you can see over here, for example, again, inflammation, repair, immunopathology, neoplasia, developmental diseases, and then you can go into the different systems, uh, nutritional pathology, hemodynamic disorders, uh, blood vessels, um, uh, cardiac system, respiratory system, gastrointestinal system, liver and biliary system, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, this basically what we're going to do is also follow a systems approach in teaching you about pathology. And if you look at any physiology textbook, we're not going to we're going to go over basic physiology, but more in the context of pathophysiology. But if you look at a physiology textbook, it's the same thing. It'll teach you something about the cell and some, and then go into different systems. It's generally a systems approach for understanding uh, the diseases. So here's the pathology diagnosis paradigm that I often teach and really want my students always to know. This is a key threshold concept, which I just talked about earlier, um, threshold knowledge or threshold concept. And what this is, this slide is very important. And what it tells you and what I'm trying to tell you with this slide is that most pathology, very simply or generally or broadly, can be broken down into three different um, uh, etiologies, if you will. Um, and so this paradigm, the three is developmental, reactive, and neoplastic. So developmental conditions means that they're either congenital or acquired diseases. Genetic component usually, but the parents may or may not be affected. A lot of genetic conditions are spontaneous or sporadic mutations. 
and the parents are actually not affected or don't have the phenotype um, and may not even have the genotype. Uh, there are symmetric features such as bilateralism or there's a midline association with a lot of developmental conditions, not necessarily, but that's a general feature. And you can start to understand the germ layer pattern of involvement, meaning when you see a developmental condition, you can start to figure out in some cases based on the clinical presentation or phenotype, if it's uh, ectodermal, endodermal, or mesodermal in origin. So germ layer pattern of involvement. And, and reactive conditions are things basically that are inflammatory or end in itis, like dermatitis, inflammation of the skin. Uh, it, but inflammation is very general and broad. broad. It can be acute, it can be chronic, um, it can be due to infection, trauma, autoimmune conditions, um, and you can even throw neuralgia and neuropathy into this reactive category where nerves are injured or are, are hypersensitive or reacting to something. So that's, that's what this category of reactive means. Um, and there's usually classic signs and symptoms of inflammation in reactions such as redness, heat, swelling, pain, and loss of function, but not always. Um, and sometimes there's only one of these features, if at all. And then finally, the third category that most diseases can be placed in is neoplastic. Neo means new, plastic means plasia um, or growth, so new growths. And this could be malignant tumors, like cancers by definition, or benign tumors, which are not malignant or cancer by definition. Um, general features of each of these neoplasms, not features, sorry for that misspelling. <laughs> um, there's general features for each of these neoplasms, and we'll discuss these. For example, benign tumors are generally well-defined, orderly, encapsulated, um, versus malignant cancers or tumors are more poorly or ill-defined, maybe um, uh, more proliferative or um, uh, indurated clinically and things like that. So we'll, we'll go over examples and, and talk about that. And we'll also talk about concepts like dysplasia which is what we refer to as precancerous change, basically, and then metaplasia and also anaplasia. And right now I'm getting, I'm just introducing some of these terms, so don't worry, you don't have to go look up metaplasia right away or anaplasia right away. You will have lectures eventually, at some point, down the line, which, will, which I will go into much more detail on neoplasia, tumorigenesis, carcinogenesis, cell cycle genes and proteins and these concepts histologically of dysplasia, metaplasia, and anaplasia. So you'll get it a lot more detail, but right now I just want to introduce the concept. In this introductory lecture, I'm really just trying to give you a taste test, if you will, of the types of things that we're going to discuss and what we're going to go into and what you're going to learn. So when we talk about clinical lesions and, and this paradigm that I just introduced in the last slide of developmental reactive or neoplastic, we try to apply it to clinical pathology like this. So in this case here on the upper left, you see a cleft. This is a cleft uvula and palate, and you can see that the bone, there's only mucosa here, and that the palatal shelves did not fuse in the midline here. And so this is an example of a cleft palate. Um, there's genetic reasons for this, there's environmental reasons for this, but you can see that there's a very midline association or distribution and it's very bilateral about this midline so if you draw a line in the middle of this one half looks like the other half that's very characteristic of developmental pathology and that's why we say it has a midline association or or symmetry or bilateralism and that's very very clear in cases of cleft lip or palate um, even when you see a cleft lip it's usually near the midline or one side or the other of the midline um, here's another case of just kind of um, decalcification or loss or erosion or hypocalcification of enamel in a patient throughout all of their teeth. So this diffuse bilateral multiple teeth presentation really tells you that there's probably something developmental going on um, in this patient up here on the upper uh, right. On the lower left here, you can see a patient that has redness and some crusting and bleeding. This is very painful clinically and it's blistering. This has a lot of cardinal signs of inflammation, right? Redness, swelling, heat, pain. Um, and this is, so 
this is the upper right here. Let me just tell you what this was. This is a, a amelogenesis imperfecta, a developmental condition of abnormal enamel formation. Um, down here on the lower left, you're seeing what's called erythema multiforme, uh, which is kind of a hypersensitivity or allergic reaction to different types of foods or medications. And, and medications are the big one that we look for when we see this clinically. Uh, this can be on the skin as target lesions, or it can just appear as this kind of perioral uh, inflammation or dermatitis or mucositis, if you will. Um, and then over here on the lower right, we have a patient that has this leukoplakia with some ulceration and some red areas. Um, maybe it's a lichenoid reaction or inflammation, uh, like a contact stomatitis, or maybe it's a precancerous or dysplastic lesion because it's a leukoplakia in a high-risk site, ventral lateral tongue. So we'll talk about what these things are, what they look like, how they present clinically, what the histology of these looks like if you were to biopsy it when it's inflamed versus precancerous versus cancerous, um, et cetera, et cetera. So just giving you an idea. So what, what you're going to have now is a quiz question. And, um, and where you'll have quizzes throughout here and then some test questions at the very end of this presentation. And this is how we assure that you're going through the PowerPoints and then able to you know, answer successfully questions afterwards. Don't worry too much about quiz questions and tests and exams. Um, I really, truly, my intent is to make this, these lectures, this course, this one year program, and, and I've explicitly stated this to all of my faculty, that I really want to make it fun, and I want to make it a good educational experience for you, and not very stressful because it, there's enough to learn in a year, there's enough you're going to have to go through and do, that I really want to be here for you as far as making it as easy as I can, but yet educational and informative and high level and high quality. Um, so, so, so really don't stress out too much about these quiz and test questions. They should be relatively easy if you've gone through the material. And um, so now when we talk about pathology clinically, you have to be able to, as one of the first steps, describe a lesion. If you can't describe a lesion, you can't explain the pathology clinically to anybody, to a colleague, to a peer, um, to a patient, or anything like that. So there, we have a lot of important clinical descriptors that we use, and these descriptors give a lot of insight into differential diagnosis or even definitive diagnosis without even biopsy or radiographs or x-rays or anything like that. So clinical description is key. So here I have a clinical lesion. I would say it's on the face, the lower right side of the face, extending from the right labial mucosa and vermilion border down to the chin, um, uh, basically in the right mandibular region. And so there's lots of different ways you can describe this, but the ways to describe it is size, shape, color, morphology, texture, anatomic location. And so these are the things that, that, that we want to do to, to very accurately clinically describe something. So all of that information I gave anatomically can now be used to describe a few centimeter in size kind of um, elliptical or wedge-like ulcerated red-white lesion with um, bleeding and erythema and inflammation, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, these are all great descriptors for something like this. And there's a thousand different ways, that, you know, a thousand different people can describe this. Um, but there should be some kind of common overlapping themes uh, among everyone. But to be able to describe this, as I mentioned, you have to know the anatomy, which I'm showing you down here to the right. You have to know what the commissure is, what the vermilion border is, um, where the mucosa meets the um, epithelium and epidermis. Um, so anatomy, 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 anatomy. Very, very important before you can start to understand pathology. Right. So here's a nice little slide showing you some kind of characteristic lesional descriptions which come from histology, which is microscopic anatomy, and also from macroscopic anatomy, gross anatomy, what you can see, feel, touch clinically. And so these terms, a cyst is basically an epithelial line sac with fluid in it. A fissure is a cut in, in um, some type of tissue. Here we can see a, a 
the skin and there's a fissure, um, which is basically a cut going through it. And then going over here to the right, you can see that fissure again. And then there's a couple of other terms, erosion and ulcer. Erosion theoretically is parts of the mucosa or epithelium or skin are missing. Um, and this could happen in other tissues, not just epithelium, but it's commonly used for epithelium. And then an ulcer means that it's all the way to the base of that. So all the way to the connective tissue, basically. And then there's macule, which means just a flat lesion. This is often used for things like melanotic macule or pigmented brown lesion, which you can see in the mouth commonly. Um, a nodule means a raised lesion, generally more than five millimeters in diameter. A papule is kind of like a nodule, but it's smaller, less than five millimeters in diameter usually. And a polyp is kind of like a mushroom. It's a pedunculated lesion. A pustule is basically, it's kind of like a cyst, but without the epithelial lining. It's a sac, I mean, sorry, it's not, it's, it, it, it's not necessarily an epithelial sac, but it's an area or collection of pus. And a pus generally has what we call exudate. Exudate is something with specific gravity over 1.015, and you don't need to memorize that, but what that means is basically that it's, it's kind of dense or cloudy um, or rich. And, and fibrinous and, 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 and purulent, if you will. So that's, that's what an exudate is, as opposed to something like a transudate. And a transudate is um, what we see in vesicles usually. And these are important. Large transudates or vesicles are what we call bullae. And a bullae is basically just a larger version of a vesicle. And, and some of these like distinctions are a little bit arbitrary. If it's relatively small, or a few millimeters, we call it a ves vesicle. Once it gets to like five millimeters or more, we start to call it a boule. Um, and a lot of times that can be indicative of something like a viral infection, not a bacterial infection, which would be more of an exudate or a pustule. Um, whereas a vesicle might be something like a burn or a viral infection. So these clinical descriptors give us a lot of information on what potentially the patient could have. And a wheel is basically just kind of like a rash on the skin. And then there are papillary or verrucous or wart-like lesions, like you can see here, one histologically. And these are, these look, these are very, um, look like warts, basically. Uh, cauliflower, tapioca, frog eggs, these are different terms that are used to describe it. And we'll see examples of all of these. And then there are plaques. A plaque can be from keratosis or from precancer or cancer, where the epithelium or mucosa is raised and it's thicker. And we use this in dentistry a lot, leukoplakia, or erythroleukoplakia, white plaques or red-white plaques. All right, so you're going to have a quiz question now about that information, and another quiz question about it. And back to the slides. So this is just to show you the muscles of the face. Again, why this is important is because you have to know normal anatomy before you can understand pathology. You have to know normal anatomy to describe pathology, to describe where pathology is. So all of these, and, and you know, most of us as dentists, we've had this, or even physicians, you've had anatomy. So a lot of this is just review. Don't go crazy looking at this slide and now reviewing every single muscle again. Uh, that's not the point. Um, just you know, quickly glance at it and, and that's about it. A good thing with anatomy is if you don't remember it, you can look it up. It can be reference material, but what's not reference material is appreciating and knowing that you have to know the anatomy to be able to describe and understand pathology, all right? There's lots of different anatomy. There's muscle layers, right? We have the nerves. The nerves are very important to lots of different pathology, not just neuralgias and neuropathies, but also nerve tumors and lots of other things that affect the head and neck and oral and maxillofacial structures. So knowing the nerve anatomy or reviewing it is is good and is important. And we'll do that with at each case that we do. I will reinforce and remind all of us of what the anatomy is and ask you about the anatomy. And those will be learning needs that you'll do and you'll look some of that up to refresh your memory, if you will. All right. um, microscopic anatomy is also very important, as I mentioned. And that's the basis of what we call histology. And this is a nice little um, histology here showing you uh, a stratified squamous epithelium, which is what you can see in oral mucosa or on the skin. And here, 
you can see a stratified squamous mucosa, and most of this comprises keratinocytes. And this will make up what we call the epidermis or mucosa, if it's in the mouth, for example. Occasionally, there's melanocytes, and these absorb UV pigment, sorry, these absorb UV rays and convert it to melanin pigment or stored in melanin pigment. So um, once in a while, you'll see a melanocyte, and these kind of have a halo, um, so, halo cytoplasm, and, and, and then um, mostly there are keratinocytes, as I mentioned. Most of these squamous cells are keratinocytes. And then there are also occasionally Langerhans Hans cells. Longer Hans cells might be something like this, where it might have dendritic um, processes going out. And these are immune cells involved in immunopathology. And these are antigen presenting cells. So they're actually there to kind of taste and test what's coming through the skin or into there or on the skin, as far as maybe a foreign body or infection and things like that. And the longer Han cells can then prime the immune system that something's coming or something's here. And that's important. Why? Because what does this kind of skin normally do, whether it's in your mouth or on your hand? Um, it is a multi-layered protective type of, uh, of um, histology and function. So structure does lead to function. That's very important. And it also is supposed to absorb, for example, out on the skin, absorb melanin pigment. So you can see some of this brownish change at the bottom here. And the melanocytes will absorb UV pigment and can actually store it in the keratinocytes. Um, and so, and then you have the longer Han cells. So it, it's very fascinating um, cells that are here and very unique functions. And the, the structure really give rise to the function, which I'll talk about more. And then you have connective tissue underneath, which is mainly fibroblasts, which make this kind of haphazard collagen that we're seeing here. And then there are other tissues like blood vessels and adnexal tissues. And so uh, the histology kind of gives you insight into what's happening at the cellular level. You can see individual cells, as you can see here, and tissues and organs and how they're structured. And this normal anatomy becomes important for then appreciating if there's a cancer of the skin here, like a basal cell carcinoma or a melanoma or a squamous cell carcinoma or a fibrosarcoma further down deep or an angiosarcoma of the blood vessels. Um, none of that can be appreciated until you understand this basic um, pathology, histopathology, or microscopic anatomy. And a little closer up, at the top of the epithelium, we have the dead keratin um, protein or stratum corneum. Below that is the granular layer, then the stratum spinosum, and the basal layer. And it's nice to go from the bottom to the top because it's the basal layer that really everything grows from and then differentiates and then eventually becomes this granular layer, and sometimes it's less conspicuous, other times it's, um, uh, it's it, sometimes it's inconspicuous, sometimes it, it's more overtly obvious, and then you go up to the non-cellular um, stratum corneum, and this is the keratin that kind of comes off, if you will. And so a little bit closer up of the histology, don't worry about um, too much detail, because we will go over this over and over um, especially um, in upcoming courses in oral pathology and histopathology. We'll do a lot more of this in, in detail. Um, but this is just kind of a taste test, as I said, for what's to come. Um, here's a nice schematic showing you what epidermis and dermis looks like and different structures that are there just for kind of a review. Um, and here's a quiz question related to what we just talked about. And here's an example of a condition called impetigo. And this is an infection um, of uh, an inflammation of the skin. And here you can see the normal skin epithelium, which is kind of um, a little busy and disrupted. And then here we see an ulcer with inflammatory cells, these little round blue cells all throughout here. Um, and so this is why that understanding that normal histology becomes important because that's the prerequisite for understanding abnormality and starting to see, well, what happens when the normal gets messed up and it doesn't look like it did in that previous slide? And what is this abnormality? What's in here and what's going on? Um, that's the art of pathology and histopathology, is to figure out both clinically, histologically, 
uh, even radiographically, what is going on? What are we seeing? How is the anatomy altered? And can we take knowledge, use that knowledge to understand what's happening as far as diagnosis? Um, so here's an example of a leukoplakia, which we're going to cover and learn more about. And here's an example of a cancer. And so theoretically, a precancerous lesion that eventually turned into a cancerous lesion. And you can see this looks like it's not so bad. And this looks like it's really bad clinically. Um, there's a lot of features here that tell us that this is cancerous. Indurated, poorly defined, uh, ulcerated. It's, it's just everything about it says cancer, cancer, cancer. And everything about this says, Hopefully not cancer yet, precancer, early, early, only white plaque, no erythroplakic component, maybe even just keratosis, um, et cetera, et cetera. So histologically, when we see a biopsy of something like this, it might, at, at, you know, kind of worst be what we call this dysplasia. Um, this might, this could, some people would call this a moderate to severe dysplasia. There's subjective gratings. We'll talk about all of that. But by definition, this and this is not cancer because it hasn't invaded the basement membrane. All of these weedy ridges are intact and they may be thicker and more hyperchromatic and pleomorphic and mitotic figures and weird stuff, but for the most part, this is very busy and very thicker and, and abnormal compared to the slide I showed you before of the normal um, epithelium, but it's not cancerous yet. But when we get to a biopsy of this thing down here, which looks really ugly and looks like cancer clinically, we can appreciate this histology that the epithelium is growing down into these keratin pearls or islands of cancer uh, cells. By definition, this is malignancy or cancer because it's no longer in situ or dysplastic or located where it should be. It's actually invading into the connective tissue and there's a lot of these bl little blue round cells or inflammatory cells reacting to this and it's getting pretty deep where there's muscle and blood vessels. And so this is a relatively easy diagnosis to make histologically, believe it or not. Um, the dysplasia diagnosis can be harder because it doesn't, it isn't cancer yet. And it, it can be hard to tell, is it, is it just inflammatory atypia or is it actually precancerous dysplasia and all that? And we'll talk about that in a little more detail as we go. So a little bit about histology of, of epithelium. Epithelium is one of the main tissues that we see in the oral cavity, mucosal epithelium. So here's a little nice little uh, chart showing you different types of cells, simple squamous epithelium versus cuboidal, columnar, pseudostratified, stratified, which I've been showing examples of recently. Um, and this tells you the location, the different tissues and organs in the body where they're found. And this column tells you the function. And so the structure the location, the structure, is very important for defining the function which we see over here. And what do I mean by that? Let's just look at one example which I've been showing you. Stratified squamous. Lots of layers of cells which line the esophagus, the mouth, uh, vagina, um, skin, <laughs> uh, you know, on the outside of the body. And the stratified squamous is a protective function. It protects against damage and abrasion and, and sun exposure and this and that and, and chemicals and toxins and all that kind of stuff. So you can see that this multi-layered structure and conformation and morphology gives insight into why it's a great protectant. Let's look at an example of something that's not a great protectant. Simple squamous epithelium or simple cuboidal epithelium. Look at what these things do. They're located in areas like the lungs, the air sacs, blood vessels, lymphatics, ducts, all right? Look at the function. Diffusion, secretion, secretion, absorption. That tells you that these don't do a good job of protecting against much, and they actually do a better job of letting things go right through them, secreting and absorbing things and filtrating things. So again, the way they look, the structure, the location, the way the tissues are organized morphologically or histologically gives insight into what they actually do and what their function is. So that's a very important concept or threshold knowledge. We're going to talk about things in general path like cell injury and cell death. 
uh, Dr. Audrey Boros, who you'll see in upcoming lectures, is going to talk to you about details, especially uh, clinically and histologically and cellularly, about things like physical damage, hypoxia, infectious uh, damage, autoimmunity, chemical, nutritional. And all of these things can lead to cell injury and cell death. Physical trauma can damage and kill cells. Lack of oxygen can, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so if we take an example here, which is a great general pathology teaching example, is this is a patient with diabetes that's uncontrolled and has a diabetic foot ulcer. And it's getting very deep and getting close to diabetic foot osteomyelitis. This can be very significant because it can result in months of intravenous antibiotics, anti-inflammatories, um, and can result in limb-threatening sequelae where they may have to amputate the limb, um, or it can be life-threatening. Patients can die from this. There's high morbidity and mortality associated uh, with these types of diseases when they can't be treated and controlled. And everything about this tells you that this is inflammatory, right? Swelling, redness, pain, ulceration. Um, there can be neuropathy associated with these patients, diabetic neuropathy. Um, and so this is a very good example of the concepts that we want to teach you, that I've been talking about in this lecture, and that you're going to get exposed to more. What happens here? Why is the immune system not working as well to get rid of this ulcer? And why is it secondarily infected? And why can't the body take care of this infection? whereas it would be able to, for the most part, in a non-diabetic or healthier patient. Um, and what, what is their hypoxia here? How does that contribute to the damage and necrosis that we see here? Is there ischemia? Is there a nutritional issue locally or systemically in this patient, particularly given the, the diet, lifestyle, diabetes? Is there non-compliance with medications? on and on and on and on. This is an example of so many things that, that, that I was talking about in previous slides like this, cell injury and cell death, chemical, nutritional, autoimmune, infectious, hypoxic. A lot of these apply to this one example of diabetic foot ulcer and diabetic foot osteomyelitis. So we're going to talk about concepts of how cell injury and cell death leads to inflammation. And this is the itises that I've been talking about, dermatitis, mucositis. Here's an example of a patient that got hit by a baseball bat in a fight and has some severe inflammation here. It's acute, there's redness, heat, swelling, and pain, loss of function. The patient can't see in this eye now. And this can be a severe ophthalmologic complication where the patient can end up losing their eye and vision. Um, so, but it's a great example of an inflammatory reaction and, and to teach it and reinforce inflammatory concepts. So here's another quiz question, quickly. All right, and so back to this example that I gave you. Um, this is an example of a leukoplakia, dysplasia clinically and histologically, which I showed you, and then a cancer, which was already invasive or squamous cell carcinoma. And the reason I'm showing you this is because those concepts of inflammation, redness, heat, swelling, and pain, don't necessarily apply to cancers until they're more advanced stage and actually may have some signs and symptoms associated with them. Early on, there may be actually no signs and symptoms except just a white plaque or a red-white plaque. Right? Um, versus with inflammation, the, there, there's often pain associated with it or some type of sign that vascular injury has occurred. All right? Now, an example of that is what you can see here where inflammation is activated and that can activate the complement system which is something if you don't remember you might want to review what's our complement system um, clotting will start to occur and so um, i'll talk about that in the introductory lecture of oral medicine course which you'll also have this semester um, but uh, clotting and hemostasis play very important roles here and what happens with inflammation is that there are initially changes in blood flow which is very different than what may happen initially with neoplasia. So initially you get vasoconstriction, which is transient. Then you get vasodilation to open pre-existing capillary beds by relaxing pre-capillary arterioles. So here's an example of a conjunctivitis or injection, redness of the eye, and you can see the inflammation there. Lots of things can cause this, allergens, um, trauma, things like that. 
Um, and when we see this, this, this is a classic clinical example of vasodilatation. Look at all these blood vessels dilating here. Um, uh, you can see that in, that in the background of the white sclera, right? And so that's a great example of vasodilation, the redness and the injection all throughout here, okay? And remember I talked about exudate, which has high specific gravity or more than 1.015. An example of that would be fibrin or pus. Here's an example of a patient that had a severe eye infection. This was an ophthalmologic complication which led to exoneration. So they had to lose that eye and some of the structures around there and obviously lose their vision and then have a prosthetic eye uh, placed in, in this location. So this complication can lead to nucleation, evisceration, or exoneration of the eye. And, and those are concepts that we'll kind of introduce and talk about later also. But uh, it's a great example of pus, exudate, cloudy, purulent, rich, sanguineous type of damage. Here's another example, um, which was coming from an odontogenic infection, but to the angle of the mandible. And it was red, swollen, painful, warm to touch. And when we incise it, blood and pus comes out, exudate. Highly suggestive of a bacterial infection, just like this case I showed you here. Bacterial, bacterial, bacterial. Um, let's look at that and compare that to a transudate, whereas a transudate is lower specific gravity, less than 1.015. This is usually clear to yellow fluid, less cells. This is a burn patient, and you can see how these don't look like they have pus or exudate in it but rather more of a clear or yellowish transudate. And transudates are more characteristic of burns or um, viral infections like chickenpox shown here, um, as opposed to bacterial infections, which we see with exudate. Um, and so what happens with inflammation or acute inflammation, whether we have an exudate or a transudate, is that there's damage to cells and that damage will then cause arachidonic acid to be released because that's what's found in the membrane of cells. And so when a membrane gets damaged and breaks apart, that cell will release arachidonic acid eventually. And arachidonic acid will lead to this kind of, this um, sequelae of what we call inflammation. It's a vascular process. So what that means is you need damage to cells and you need endothelium there or blood vessels to even have this process. So if you think about it, enamel doesn't get inflamed. We don't have enamelitis because we don't have blood vessels in the enamel. But we do have dermatitis because we do have blood vessels in the dermis. So it is a vascular process. What you're seeing here is a cross section, the top and the bottom of the a tube, which is a blood vessel. And these are endothelial cells down here and up here, which I'm pointing to. And then inside this blood vessel, you can see lots of red blood cells, these biconcave discs, these red things. And then inside them, there's these little multiple nucleated cells, which are called PMNs, polymorphonuclear neutrophils. Um, and so these PMNs, these are phagocytic acute inflammatory response cells. And they are the first responders when you get inflammation or acute inflammation or damage. And we'll go into more detail on some of these concepts, but look what happens that you actually start to get these things to, to, to marginate. Um, and so this is called margination. And then, so they, they come to the site of damage or injury and then they go through the blood vessel and then they get to the tissues that need attention because they are infected or there's autoimmune damage or there's foreign body or trauma or whatever happens to be the reason or reaction for the inflammatory process. Um, so here's another schematic just showing you that tissue injury can lead to lots of uh, releases of interleukins that come from arachidonic acid uh, liberation and sequelae. It can lead to mast cell activation or histamine release, complement activation, coagulation, thrombin formation, and this is what happens at the red, um, at the um, uh, vascular level here at the endothelial cells, the, the PMNs, the neutrophils or polymorphonuclear neutrophils um, start to roll, then they adhese, and then they migrate. And to do that, they have to go through specific genotypic and phenotypic changes to do that. And, and so it's actually a very interesting and fascinating phenomenon. So, 
This, and, and so the, the relationship to general pathology, this is a very threshold, no, important threshold knowledge or concept. What I'm showing you here is a cardiac skeletal muscle. And so this is the heart of a person that died from a heart attack or myocardial infarction. And you can see in this blood vessel within this cardiac fibers, these fibers that are running this way, there are these neutrophils that I showed you earlier, these multiple nucleated cells, which are, they look like Mickey Mouse ears or headphones. Um, these are neutrophils. And as I said earlier, they define acute inflammation and they're coming out they're marginating, they're rolling, and they're coming out into the skeletal muscle. And so this means that this skeletal muscle in this patient's heart got acutely inflamed. And we can see that in this, everything that I just explained can be seen in this one slice histologically, because as I was reinforcing and, and saying earlier, and this totally reinforces it, is that the histology shows us what's happening biologically, anatomically, physiologically, pathophysiologically. It's all right here in a snapshot in time. This is why this person died. They died of a myocardial infarction. They died from acute inflammation of the muscle of the heart. This was the left ventricle and it was a large infarct and it's not compatible with life in this individual given the size of the infarct. So we'll go into this in more detail eventually when we do the cardiac system and and they'll be, you'll have a whole lecture on, um, and so, it, but again, this is just kind of a fascinating to show you what occurs at the cellular level and at the level of the microvasculature and how you can see all that in the histology. And, and we will teach you this histology. You will learn some autopsy, forensic cases, general pathology, systemic pathology. That's the point of this, this course. This is why we're showing you some of these. Uh, cases, and then we'll give you unknown slides of different tissues throughout the body, and you'll actually figure out what they are and what's happening in them, and it could be anywhere in the body. So um, it's exciting. Don't get nervous. We will t hold your hand through this. We'll teach you all of this, and um, you'll come out actually understanding a lot of histopathology, a lot of um, radiographic um, anatomy and pathology, and it'll be a good thing. So just keep in mind that, again, so here's another example of, uh, this is again, skeletal muscle, uh, cardiac fibers. This is a heart muscle. And what I wanna show you is coagulative necrosis. What happens when you start to get acute inflammation, ischemia, and death, lack of oxygen and blood supply to areas like a muscle? So in this case, look what happens to the muscle when it got acutely infarcted and ischemic. There's the muscle cells, the cardiac myocytes, nice big nuclei, and then their cytoplasm is all this fibers around it, which contracts the, the heart, right? Look what happens with coagulative necrosis. To the left, you can see the normal myocardial myocardiocyte or cell and the fibers. In coagulative necrosis, it looks crappy, <laughs> is a simple way to put it. Nothing about this is good and normal, which you can see on the left. You can see some of the red blood cells here, extravasated, there's some here. Um, so there's a lot of bleeding. The fibers of the muscle are gone. The cells, the cardiac myocytes are shriveled or even disappearing. Um, and there may even be some inflammatory cells like the, those neutrophils that I told you about earlier, multiple nucleated cells. So this is what happens. The heart muscle gets infarcted, gets inflamed, ischemic, starts to die, becomes coagulatively necrotic, and even probably some apoptosis, just quiet um, cell death, if you will. And, and this can be very significant clinically, as, as you're aware of. So as I mentioned, neutrophils are phagocytic cells. Here's a close-up of how they look like. They have vesiculated cytoplasm with some kind of you know, grayish look to them and multiple nuclei, polymorphonuclear neutrophils. Um, and they are, by definition, the first to come when you have acute inflammation. So here is a blood vessel, and here's the red blood cells, the red things inside of it, the discs. And you can see those neutrophils, those Mickey Mouse ears, headphones, right? Those bunch of neutrophils in a blood vessel. 
So whatever this is, something's going on. There's acute inflammation, there's neutrophils, and they're extravasating out into the tissue. So this tells you whatever tissue this is, there's an acute inflammatory response here. So I'm going to keep reinforcing these uh, concepts, and you'll get them in other lectures and things like that. So if this is something I showed you in, in and I gave you a biopsy specimen, and I said, you ha here's an appendix biopsy specimen, and you saw a bunch of these neutrophils, you should say that there is appendicitis and acute inflammation of the appendix. All right. So where does arachidonic acid come from? Just to review a little, if you don't know where arachidonic acid comes from, it comes from uh, mem cell membrane lipids. You have linoleic and lin lin linoleic and linoic acids, which are the fatty acids um, uh, and phospholipids that make up the membrane okay, of every cell in your body, right? And that membrane has protective properties and can have receptors and let things in and out. But the fatty acids that are found in there, when you disrupt that membrane or injure it or attack it or infect it or kill it or traumatize it, when you disrupt that membrane, you release that linoic and linoleic acid and that gets converted to arachidonic acid, which is another fatty acid, if you will. And arachidonic acid starts this whole cascade of inflammation with interleukins and leukotrienes. And this is what we target with COX inhibitors and ibuprofen and aspirin and um, et cetera, et cetera. So a little re review of what prostaglandins are and leukotrienes and interleukins and tumor necrosis factor or TNF um, isn't bad. And we'll go into this in a little more detail, but I just wanted to introduce you to it because again, these are the things that we're going to talk about in order to understand what goes wrong, or pathology, if you will. So if acute inflammation doesn't resolve into wound healing, you get chronic inflammation. Chronic inflammation isn't just a time thing. It's not just temporal. It's not like, oh, we've had acute inflammation for uh, two weeks. Now it's chronic. Acute inflammation is that can actually be defined histologically by the cells that are in the area. And here's an example of the cells. Um, um, lymphocytes and uh, macrophages and um, histiocytes and these are the types of cells that define um, chronic inflammation. They aren't neutrophils, they are cells like macrophages, lymphocytes, which you see here, plasma cells, which you see here, and eosinophils, which you see here. These are the cells that more accurately define things that are chronically inflamed, which is very different than the neutrophil, which defines acute inflammation. So look what happens here. You get, let's say, trauma or some kind of activity. This is the heart, for example, and then it gets damaged and, and injured. Um, you get some kind of ischemia or injury or damage, and you get edema initially. Fluid comes into the area. It's a vascular process. Cells get injured. And then neutrophils come in at about one uh, to two days. And then monocytes start to come in and kind of peak by about two days on to about seven to 14 days. So it can be related to time, but is also related to the cellular types that we see as far as whether we have acute inflammation versus chronic inflammation, right? Ultimately though, inflammation should heal, should heal right should lead to wound healing in a healthy individual um, but there are reasons that may not happen sometimes a wound may be too much to heal um, without a little help so this is why we suture wounds right we try to get primary closure or get a primary union or healing and so um, before i talk about that a little more i want to talk about this concept of parenchymal cell versus the stroma and what regeneration uh, capacity is for certain cells. So there's this concept that's very, very important called parenchyma versus the stroma. Parenchyma or parenchymal cells are the actual functional cells in a tissue. So this is a heart, this is an area where there was an infarct and this patient died from it. And you can say that the parenchymal cells or the functional cells of the heart are the cardiac myocytes. Okay, those are the cardiac cells that do the contractions and, and, and the function of the cell, right? And then you could name other cells or other tissue types as stroma. For example, there's a pericardium around this heart. 
And that's really kind of a, a connective fibrous elastic tissue, if you will. And the pericardium is a connective tissue component, um, which is called the stroma in this example that I'm giving, versus the parenchyma, which is the actual cardiac cells or myocytes. All right, so that's just an example of the concept of what the, par the parenchyma is the functional cells or unit, and the stroma is the surrounding or supporting stuff. All right, so how does the cell regenerate? Cell regeneration is dictated by the ability of a cell to proliferate. So there are labile cells and there are stable cells, and then there are permanent cells. And cells are, can be thought of as being in the cell cycle that I'm showing you here. And, and this is a gap phase, G0 or G1. Then there is the synthesis phase. Then there's another rest or gap phase. Then there's a mitotic phase. And the reason I'm reviewing this cell cycle for you and mitosis and interphase is it, you know, that, oh, no, we have to go back and memorize all this stuff. But this cell cycle is important because cells that we're going to look at histologically in this, in this uh, program and in this course, and, and clinically even, we see these cells clinically, right? Skin, you, you can see these, these cells macroscopically. They have certain different rates, for example, uh, of turnover. For example, liver cells, hepatocytes. They're very stable, meaning they're kind of in this rest phase, but if you injure them, they can go quickly into interphase and mitosis and become uh, very active uh, replicating cells, right? But let's take another example. Nerves, central neurons, for example, they're what we call permanent cells. So if you injure a central neuron or enough central neurons, they can't get into this cycle. They can't regenerate. They don't have a lot of ability to regenerate and proliferate and make new cells and undergo mitosis, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but there are cells that are labile cells that are constantly undergoing this. For example, skin cells are very labile. They're constantly, you know, kind of sloughing off and undergoing mitosis and, and forming from the basal layer up. So knowing what cell types are where in this cell cycle becomes important for understanding what happens to tissues, right? Here's some intestinal mucosal epithelium. It's a pseudo-stratified, kind of ciliated, columnar epithelium, which you can see here. Here's the basement membrane, and then here's the connective tissue. These are mucosal glandular-like tissue that we see, like in the intestine. Okay? If you damage this, it has a pretty good ability to proliferate and regrow um, with kind of minimal scar scarring, th theoretically, compared to other sites. All right. Um, and that has to do with where the cell is. It's an epithelium that's pretty labile and in the cell cycle kind of constantly. Um, here's some examples of liver histology. And these are hepatocytes. Don't worry about memorizing this or going and looking this up. We'll, we'll show you multiple examples of this. And these are fat cells. And so this is, fat cells are very clear and have kind of an eccentric nuclei, but they look like these like water droplets, if you will, just kind of nothing in them. So there's a lot of fat in among these liver cells. The liver shouldn't have much fat, maybe an occasional fat air, you know, cell once in a while. When you start to get a lot of fatty cells in the liver, we call that fatty liver. But, and that can be very common to certain medications or alcohol is very common. Alcoholism can lead to or nutrition. Lots of things can lead to, to fatty liver. Um, but in a lot of cases, it can be reversible because the liver can regenerate. It has a pretty good regenerative capacity. So if you um, stop the drinking and give it time and, and healthy diet and exercise and all that, theoretically, your liver can recover uh, at a certain point because of its ability and cell cycle kind of location, right? So, um, but let's look at some cardiac muscle. Again, here's the fibers of the heart, cardiac cell. There's some vasculature among it, and there's the cardiac myocytes. And this looks okay, but what happens when you get a, um, a coagulative necrosis and ischemia, and like I showed you before, of uh, this cardiac muscle? It can't really regenerate. You're not going to get a lot of new cardiac muscle. It's going to pretty much be necrotic and then fibrotic. So why will it become fibrotic? Because there isn't a real ability in the cell cycle that I just showed you earlier for this cell to go into it and to just make lots of new cells. 
there are ways to do that and experimentally and in models, but it's very hard naturally for the body to do that and make lots of new muscle cells. So when you get a lot of a large myocardial infarct and those cells die, you don't get most of that back. You get a lot of what we call fibrosis. So here's an example of fibrosis. There's some glandular tissue here, and I'll show you examples of this later, and you'll, you'll be able to see this and say, oh, this is glandular tissue under histology uh, soon. But this and is an example of the same tissue that now is kind of shriveled up and has a lot of these collagenous fibers rotating around it. Um, and it's because of damage and infection to this tissue that led to eventually scarring and fibrosis. So fibrosis is a normal response, and there can be different types of collagens which lead to this fibrous tissue that we see. There's type 1 collagen, which is very common in a mature scar, which is what you're seeing here on the skin. Underneath, there's a mature scar. See how it's kind of a, a uh, dense, homogeneous collection of collagen versus the more normal area where you have skin, a pilosebaceous kind of hair follicle unit, and that haphazard arrangement of connective tissue, which you saw earlier in the normal histology uh, slide. In this area where it's scarred, it's a lot of collagen fibers making a mature scar, but it, has, it doesn't have that wavy conformation uh, that normal collagen does. So it tells us this is a collagen, but in a scar, actually. So there's type 1 collagen, and here's what it's found in. There's type 2 collagen, type 3, which is keloids, for example, and then type 4, which is basement membrane. So a nice little review of the different types of collagens and, and we'll, the types that we'll be looking at. Collagen can be abnormal just to begin with. There are developmental or genetic conditions. Uh, for example, Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome or cutix laxa. Uh, this is a heterogeneous group of disorders due to defective collagen synthesis. And because of that, you, they have hyperextensible skin. You can pull their skin. Um, they have hypermobile joints. You can take their thumb and put it all the way back. I can't do that. See, my thumb only goes about that much. Um, so these are unique conditions related to abnormal collagen synthesis. So not just wound healing, but abnormal collagen synthesis. Let's look at osteogenesis imperfecta. This is an autosomal uh, dominant group of disorders uh, for gene mutations for collagen type 1. Um, just as one example, and, and there, there may be other more complex uh, mutations depending on the subtypes. But it uh, gives you a nice example of when you don't have that collagen, you end up um, getting attenuated bone, um, you get fracture calluses, um, and you can get bowing of the bone and things like that, genuverum, valgum. So it can be a major problem because collagen is also required to form heart tissues like, like bone. Um, so excessive collagen synthesis can be seen in dermal proliferative disorders like keloid formation, where you get too much collagen being formed. Um, hypertrophic scars. Um, here's a lap uh, scar, and you can see um, an example of that. Or um, facial scars after um, a, a patient was injured and, and wounded. And so a dermal proliferative uh, kind of response. And histologically, you get a very, very thickened uh, dermis and collagen haphazard uh, uh, presentation. Um, and then so after inflammation, we want healing, obviously, and that's why we get some fibrosis and scarring and, and clot formation and collagen deposition and all that. So there's two concepts in healing, healing by primary intention or healing by secondary intention. Healing by primary intention is we close the wound, and that's why um, we do it, because we want to promote healing by primary union and primary intention. You get less scarring, less chance of infection, better aesthetic results, and better functional results. And this is a schematic of what that would look like clinically. Um, but we could have healing by secondary intention or secondary healing. And here's an example of some of those and what that would look like. And because of the, in secondary healing, we don't close it and we don't get that nice kind of linear um, uh, suture-based closure. And, and we, we end up getting a larger defect in the larger area and more scarring. And so it, there are consequences and sequelae associated with secondary healing versus primary healing. Sometimes you don't have a choice. You have to let things heal uh, by secondary. Um, so let's do a quiz question here. And so what factors affect healing and repair? I kind of brought up this case before. Infection, tissue type, anatomy, blood supply, nutritional status, concurrent systemic diseases like diabetes, medications the patient may be on. So um, 
so that's it for this one. You know, I think I've taken enough of your time, but um, hopefully that was enjoyable and palpable and, and really just kind of something, like I said, a taste test to give you an idea of what kind of concepts myself and other faculty that you have met already, hopefully, and um, will be interacting with, want to kind of guide you through and teach you. And so thank you very much, and I'll see you next time I see you in the next lecture.